Get situated just a little bit. Whew. Wow, it is bright up here. Pastor Randy talks about it. Oh, so, when Pastor Kim asked me if I would be willing to share a message on authentic relationships, I have to be honest, I thought she was kidding. Seriously, me? <laughs> you want me to give relationship advice? <laughs> God has such a sense of humor. So I responded with, I think I need to pray about it. And for those of you who don't know, that's code for, I haven't decided how to say no yet. So just give me a few days to formulate my excuse, find someone else, or put my house on the market and move. <laughs> Seriously, I spent a lot of time on Zillow that week. But on the morning I needed to give Pastor Kim and Tracy my answer, something happened. After a week of praying and not really hearing much from God on the matter, he so clearly spoke a message to me. It went something like this, Mel, I love you so much. And it has been absolutely wonderful spending all of this time with you over the last year and a half while you have been healing. But sweetie, you and I know, we both know it's time. It's time for you to come out of hiding. And in that moment, I knew exactly what God wanted me to share with you this morning. A message about hide and seek. I never wondered what it's like to play hide and go seek with a three-year-old. Here I come. Hmm. I know where he is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three. Precious, I brought with me this morning my son's special blankie from when he was just a little guy. As you can tell, it's been loved, and it has been, it's played its fair share of hide and seek. In fact, if my son ever felt insecure, this blanket, along with a big hug from mom, could calm him down 
as if it made his fears invisible. So I borrowed it this morning, just in case I needed a little help to stay grounded. And worst case scenario, throw it over my head if I need to sneak out. <laughs> For my kiddos, hide and seek started with blankies. But as they got older, it progressed into a much more advanced game. Hide and seek tag. They'd play it pretty much any time we were at a playground with friends. It had hiders, a seeker, and a home base. It would start just like a regular game of hide and seek, with the counting and the ready or not, here I come. But the object of the game was not so much about finding the best place to hide, and more about being strategic or fast enough in avoiding the seeker for long enough to make it back to home base. Anyone ever play a game like this before or watched your kids play? Yeah. I'm curious. Would you rather be a hider or a seeker? Hiders, raise your hand. Seekers? Or it just makes you tired to think about it, right? <laughs> oh yeah, that's how I feel. It makes me tired and thirsty. The Bible is full of stories about hide and seek. Beginning in the very first book of Genesis, right after Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Adam, Eve, come out, come out wherever you are. So he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman, the woman you put here, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And just like that, it began the very first game of hide and seek with God. Adam and Eve felt exposed, fear and shame for the very first time. So they hid. Then, when they were found, they tried to cover themselves and began blaming and making excuses to justify their hiding. I think that night was probably the first argument between a husband and a wife. Can you guys imagine how uncomfortable it would have been to be around Adam and Eve after that exchange with God? Adam, you really blamed me, God for making me for you? I don't remember you trying to stop me. Why didn't you just stick up for me? Or better yet, why didn't you just tell that serpent to get lost? Really, Eve? You're not going to take any responsibility? You know I have a hard time saying no to you, especially when you're naked. <laughs> <sighs> Could hiding be a cause for conflict in our relationships? It seems like humans have been hiding ever since. It's as if we're genetically predisposed to it. Don't we all do it? Haven't we all played hide and seek with God at some point in our lives? I can't speak for you, but I know I certainly have. Which made me wonder, can hiding ever be healthy? Is there a way to hide? and live authentically at the same time. As I searched the Bible for other stories of hide and seek, something became very clear. There are two kinds of hiding. A hiding that became protective to both our relationships and it connects us to God. And there's a hiding that is destructive to our relationships and disconnects us from God. Protective hiding might look like baby Moses 
being hidden in a blanket and floated down a river to Pharaoh's daughter. Rahab, hiding Joshua's men and sneaking them out of a window to escape the rulers of Jericho. Hadassah, otherwise known as Queen Esther, hiding her ethnicity from her husband. To later um, save her people. And David, fleeing and hiding in the wilderness as King Saul sought to destroy him. Some destructive hiding might look like Adam and Eve after eating the forbidden fruit. Abraham hiding that Sarah was his wife and telling a half-truth about her being his sister, not once, but twice. Jonah hiding from God when asked to warn the people of Nineveh. Rachel, hiding her father's idol to take with her when she left her father's house to be with Jacob. And then we have David, hiding again, but this time after committing adultery and then murder. You see, one kind of hiding is done with God and possibly even by God. And the other kind of hiding is done without God and possibly from God. Both forms of hiding can be due to incredibly difficult circumstances. During a loss or a time of extreme insecurity or threat, they can both seem adaptive or protective, but there are some key differences. Does my clicker work? Okay. Where do I point? There we go. (laughs) Hiding with God lasts only for a developmental season. Hiding without God lasts for as long as we want it to, we are found out or get caught. Hiding with God protects both the person hiding and the people in relationship with them. Without God, it puts the people in relationship with them in dangerous situations. With God, it supports the big picture and it heightens our view without, obscures the big picture and limits our view. With promotes even greater trust in God and without prevents trust in anything or anyone. With develops character traits like humility, patience, integrity, and courage. Without develops character traits like pride, impatience, entitlement, and defensiveness. With God, we might start to reflect the image of God in us. From might begin to distort the image of God in us. With, we find our hearts being softened towards God and towards others. Without, hardens our heart towards God and others. With leads to future growth, healing, rest, freedom, safety, and life. Without leads to future hiding, hurting, exhaustion, bondage, danger, and even death. So how do we know if we're hiding? Like I said before, we are genetically predisposed to it. And the reality is, we can be hiding and not even know that we're doing it. I can think of times when God clearly hid me from something, but it wasn't until much later that I realized what had happened. And some of my own patterns of hiding, the ones done without God, they started when I was so young, I can't even remember. I can't tell you exactly how to know if you're doing it, but as someone who has done my own fair share, I can tell you there are signs, symptoms, side effects from both that can result from hiding with and without God. You could call these the fine print. Hiding with God 
we begin to focus on the goodness of God and his provision. We have more than enough. Without, we'll lose fo- focus on the good things in our lives and we become discontent. It's never enough. With, we seek out wise counsel and honest feedback. Without, we'll shy away from wise counsel and honest feedback. With, we look up to God for identity and allow him to assign us our roles. Without, we look around to others to tell us who we are and we define our own roles. With, we'll pour out our feelings to God and learn how to process and deal with them. Without, an extreme desire to numb our feelings and avoid them with, fill in the blank. Over anything, overeating, overworking, over drinking, pick your poison. Over shopping, for me it's over chocolate. Yeah. Hiding with God, we start to support, pitch in, and follow instructions. We actually want to obey. Without, we'll compare, we'll fix, and we'll try to control the outcome so that we don't have to obey. With, we start to self-reflect, and we can take personal responsibility and maybe even accountability. Without, you might find yourself projecting, blaming, and creating stories in your head. With, you might find yourself having a strong desire to want to meet God in his word without an indifference to God's word. And with, you could possibly experience peace, joy, and hope that makes absolutely no sense. And without, happiness seems momentary and it becomes difficult to stay present or ever feel at peace. So now what? Short of being completely exposed or being found out, how do we come out of hiding? Or move from hiding alone without God to hiding with God? Is it even possible? And if it's possible, is it worth it? God did it. He wasn't exactly hiding, but his people had stopped seeking him when he came to seek them in the form of Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And while Jesus lived with us in the flesh, he gave us multiple examples of how to help people come out of hiding. In most of these examples, you will see this one thing. Unintentional, done with intention or on purpose, conversation, the interchange of thoughts and information by spoken word, oral communication between persons, a dialogue. You see, these intentional conversations with Jesus seem very much planned in advance, as if the person he's speaking with is set up. And there's a very clear back and forth, a dialogue of asking questions and getting answers on both sides. There's one intentional conversation in particular that I think displays this so beautifully, and it can be found in John 4. We'll pick up the story in verse 3. They shouldn't give me a clicker. (laughs) So, Jesus left Judea and went back. (sighs) Jesus left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. That's incredibly specific, isn't it? An intentional setup. 
There was another way to get to Galilee, but Jesus, he had to go through Samaria and be at this well right around noon. When a Samaritan woman said to him, or when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Seems innocent enough, right? You've been traveling all morning, it's hot, and you're at a well. Wrong. With this one question, Jesus starts to break down some pretty heavily fortified walls. The cultural wall between Samaritan and Jew, let's just say, they had history that went all the way back to the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and even though they claimed to worship the same God using the same Torah, there was not much love or trust between them. And then there's the wall between man and woman, and we already know how far back that goes, but the barriers are especially strong in this setting. During this time, a Jewish man would not have felt it was culturally acceptable to even speak to a woman in public, especially not to a Samaritan woman. And I so love this woman. She doesn't shy from what he's done at all. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And in case we didn't already know, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus, he sees that now she is ready for the conversation he really wants to have. So he gets right to the point. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. It's as if Jesus just turned into a traveling salesman. Man, he's like, I have something even better than water I want to share with you, like the newest water purifier, you know? Like, yeah. Um, but she's not quite buying it. So she asks a very logical question. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? In other words, who do you think you are? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Without me, you'll never have enough. With me, you'll have more than enough. Let me fill you with my living water. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Wow. Jesus goes for it, doesn't he? Right to the condition of her heart. Even now in our culture, we can begin to fill in the gaps of this statement with potential judgments. Married five times, she must have had some real issues. But the reality is, none of us have any idea why this woman was married five times. 
Possibly she was widowed. Maybe she was abused or betrayed. What if she just had a difficult time conceiving? We don't know if her failed marriages had anything to do with her at all. But Jesus knew. And anyone who has ever been through even one death of a marriage or the loss of a spouse will tell you this. She almost certainly experienced some trauma. And her reasons for coming to the well in the middle of the day, all by herself, began to take shape. It seems like she's possibly been hiding without God for a while now. And I so love what happens next. Because her next statement seems to show us she is so ready to come out. You see, she doesn't get defensive. She doesn't act like a victim. She doesn't even try to explain her situation away. It's as if she suddenly pulls the blanket from over her head and begins to see Jesus. And she starts to ask him her questions. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus, he's always seen her. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ. He's coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Hi, my name is Jesus Christ, the savior of the world, and I've come here for you. Just then, his disciples returned from buying food. And we're surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Maybe they're hiding a little, too. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And just like that, she went from being a hider to a seeker. But the story doesn't end there. The people came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard it for ourselves, and we know that this man is really the savior of the world. You see, something happens when someone comes out of hiding and goes public. It inspires and encourages others to do the same. I love the way Jesus doesn't just leave her after their conversation to figure out the rest on her own. No, he leaves her with a family of believers. Her game of hide and seek tag and safely at home base 
with others who believe in him, not just because of what she told them, but because they met Jesus themselves. As Pastor Pete likes to say, Jesus happened to them. I believe with everything in me that this is the foundation for authentic relationships. When we begin to come together, worshiping united in spirit and living in truth. The truth of who God is, who he created us to be, and what Jesus did to cover our sins and bring us safely and securely back to him. What if, what if we stopped walking around with blankets over our heads, bumping into one another like toddlers, and started using our blankets to cover one another in Christ's love when we need a safe place to come out of hiding and share? I recognize that there may be someone here who is in the middle of an incredibly difficult season. And for that person, I want you to know I see you, and more importantly, God sees you. And I want to personally leave you with something that saved me when I was in the most difficult hiding season with God in my life. It was a time of deep mourning and great loss when I knew that the life I had previously known would never be the same. During this time, I would wake up in the middle of the night caught in what seemed to be my worst nightmare. With cold sweats, streaming tears, and panic attacks. On those nights, I discovered that reading the Psalms felt like God wrapping me up and holding me in a blanket to calm my racing heart and mind. There's one psalm in particular, written by a master of hide-and-seek, King David, that paints the most beautiful picture of what it's like to make it safely to home base with Jesus. Would you all mind reading Psalm 23 with me? You guys up for that? All right, cool. Oh, here we go. You ready? I think I need cachet up here to like get y'all pumped up or something. I don't know. (sighs) Okay. I, I just, I think we can do it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So good. More than enough? Living water? Yes. So here we are on Saturday, May 6th, at FCF Church. It is now 10, 10 a.m., and you, my sweet sister, have been set up. It's now your turn, right where you're at, to take the next 15 to 20 minutes to have your own intentional conversation with Jesus. Ask him your questions, seek his guidance, and knock on his door because he promises. When you ask, you'll receive. When you seek, you will find. And if you knock, he'll be waiting at the door to open it for you. Enjoy your time with Jesus.
Thank you.